And I think people usually use the stresses as indicators to determine when the earthquakes may occur and how much the cold seismic sleep is. So for example, in these classic you know, earthquake cycle models, like in the time predictable model, the earthquakes happen here at a certain uh, yielding stress level. So if we can estimate this stress level, then we can determine or predict the timing of the earthquakes. But today I will talk about that besides this variation of the stresses, the materials also change over time, especially in the near fault region. And this you know, change of the materials can also affect how earthquakes occur and the recurrence intervals or other kinds of earthquake cycle behaviors. So let's just zoom into the near fault rocks, you know, which contain the fault cores and the fracture rocks here. And people usually refer to this particular structure, the fault dammer zone. And we also know that earthquakes tend to occur inside the fault dammer zones instead of outside. You can also simplify this using, you know, a model like this, which is literally like a tabular structure, although we know that this is not too close to the reality. So in this tabular uh, structure, we have the full core surrounded by these hundreds of meters wide uh, damaged rocks. And in some other cases, we can also observe that there could be multiple strands of fault gouges, you know, bounded by lengths of damaged rocks, which is certainly much more complicated scenario. And in this scenario, earthquakes can happen along all these different, uh, you know, fault traces, but they are still concentrating inside this fault damage zone structure. And another interesting observation about the fault zone damage is that as the fault displacement accumulates, there is usually a you know, growth of the fault damage zone. So for example, if you look at the macro fracture data, you can see that as the fault displacement increases, there is an increase of the fault damage zone width as well. And after the fault displacement gets larger than about 100 meter, there also seems to be a saturation of the fault damage zone. So the mature uh, fault damage zones are usually like several hundred meters wide, as also observed in the seismic observations. And here I'm just using a table to summarize like the, you know, some uh, material properties <coughs> and also the dimensions of the fault damage zones. And these are just some major folds in California and also the Nordima fold in Japan, as well as the Anatolian fold in Turkey. You can see that these major strike steep fold damage zones are about 100 to 400 meters wide, although there is exception. So Calico fold zone is very wide, like about 1.3 to 1.5 kilometer wide. And from all these seismic wave analysis, you can, can also estimate, you know, how much velocity is reduced inside the fault damage zone. And the velocity reductions for P and S waves here is usually between like about 30% to 60%. So it's a huge velocity reduction inside, which tends to trap the seismic waves, like I will discuss later. And from this table, because these are all mature folds, we can also say that you know, the mature fault zones tend to have a higher velocity reduction, usually larger than 30%. And I will use this to you know, um, like discriminate the mature fault zones from the immature fault zones later in our simulations. As I mentioned, earthquakes tend to occur inside the fault damage zones, and there are a lot of observations about that too. So for example, these two figures are about the Fort Normal earthquake density in Southern California and Northern California. So this just draws the, you know, the earthquake density as a function of the Fort Normal distance. And you can see that after a certain distance, the earthquake density actually decays really fast which means that there is a characteristic scale in which earthquakes tend to occur. And we can actually use this characteristic scale to also estimate you know, how large that fault damage zone structure is. So for Southern California, for example, this is like the half width here is about 100 meter. So the total width is like about 200 meter structure. And you can also see that for Northern Cascadia, this fault damage zone structure is narrower than what would be suggested for Southern California. And assuming that you know, all these earthquakes are contributing to the damage you know, again and again, uh, Benzen and Zelapian has 
have estimated the damage volume from the background seismicity in California for like almost 40 year period. So all these, you know, red parts are estimated damage volume from these background seismicity. So you can see that there is a lot of damage generated just by the small earthquakes and also large earthquakes for sure. You can see from this map that this also indicates there is a, a long strike variation of the damage inside the fault damage zones, which means that this damage structure is definitely not coherent, you know, in a very long uh, distance along the strike as well. So this is something that we need to consider in our simulations too. Well, besides this spatial variation of the fault zone damage, the temporal variation of the fault zone damage has also been observed and verified through seismic velocity analysis. So in, especially like after big earthquakes, people can observe reductions in seismic wave velocities. And then during the post seismic period, there could be an increase of the seismic wave velocities. And the figures here are just demonstrating a very recent example from the 2019 Ridgecrest main shock. So you can see that after the magnitude 7.1 uh, ridge crest main shock, there is like about six to 7% reduction observed from this station very close to the fold. But then just for several days after the main shock, there is also an increase and actually a very fast increase for the first day, you know, for the seismic wave velocities here. And if you uh, look at the spatial variation of this uh, seismic wave velocity change, you can see that right after the earthquake, there is a larger region that has undergone a seismic wave velocity reduction. But then after 14 days, like only a small region close to the fold that still has this velocity reduction. So it means that the heating time in the Ridgecrest region must be like in the scale of days, which is really fast. But there is also another observation, which is from the Lenders uh, Fault region. So this is from the Vidali and Lee paper in 2003. And their approach is a little bit different from the Ridgecrest study here. So they have done several active surveys in the Lenders Fault region to see how much seismic velocities change over time. And all these blue dots are the data points they have. And then the lines are the inferred change of the seismic wave velocities. So they are inferring that there is a slow increase of the seismic wave velocities in the Landers region after the Landers earthquake. They also infer that there could be another change of the, after the Hector Mine earthquake, which is not far from the Landers fault region. And then afterwards, there is another increase of the seismic wave velocities. And if you compare these two field observations, although their sensitivity and their approaches are different, but you can see that the heating time uh, of the damage close to the fault may be very different if you look at different regions. So what may be responsible for you know, this inter healing is still something that we are not 100% sure about, but there are some mechanisms that people have proposed before to explain and the fluid has constantly brought, been brought up as you know, a possible mechanism for this inter healing. And the figures here are still from the Vidali and Lee paper. So they're uh, inferring that the fluid may play a very important role because the P waves uh, are more sensitive to you know, this inter healing as shown by the top figure. So the red line here is the cumulative velocity increase for the P waves. And the blue line here is for the S waves. So you can see that there is a larger velocity increase as inferred by the P waves, uh, which indicates that the fluid is you know, playing some uh, role here. And assuming that you know, this healing is caused by this closure of the partially saturated cracks, then they can also estimate it how much water saturation is needed. So this is the ratio of the P2S travel time decrease. And they infer that there is a, a increase in the water saturation from 60% to 80% you know, during these several years of scale in the Landers region. And there's another paper that I find really interesting and was published in the same year, 
by Gratier et al. in 2003. And they have explained, like even when the fluid is playing a role here, there could be a lot of different mechanisms that are playing as the cracks are sealed or healing. So when the cracks have a small aperture, after the crack healing here can be mostly driven by a lowering of the surface energy. So this is like a physical process itself. However, when the crack it has a larger aperture, then other kinds of processes like the chemical process needs to play a role, which means that the crack sailing here actually needs the influx of external material into the cracks through processes like the pressure solution. So I think like there are still a lot of different mechanisms that people need to explore to explain why you know, there could be a healing process in the near fault materials. So in this particular research we are doing, we're trying to consider this temporal evolution of the fault zone structure in our uh, earthquake cycle simulations um, to understand how they may change the earthquake behaviors. So we're using a 2D fully dynamic earthquake cycle simulations. And I will talk about why we're using fully dynamic models in a minute. Uh, but here is just to show that we can model the different stages of the seismic cycles uh, including the interseismic stage in which we have the locked regions surrounded by the creeping region. And once the speed rate gets over like then uh, one millimeter per second, we have the cold seismic stage in which we have the nucleation of the rupture and the propagation of seismic sleep, as well as the radiation of the seismic waves. And this particular uh, figure shows the, you know, the typical layout of our uh, model. So we have a 1D vertical fault that has different kinds of frictional behaviors. For the majority part of the shallow fault, we have the velocity weakening friction that promotes the nucleation of the rupture. But then for the very shallow part and deeper part, we have the velocity strengthening friction that promotes the aseismic seep. And this work is primarily done by my student, Prithvi Thakur, who is here. And if you're interested in our code, you can also check out the spare on GHub. As I mentioned, it's actually important to consider the dynamic effects because the full diamond zones here, although are very tiny, they can actually trap a lot of seismic waves inside which in turn change the stresses during the dynamic rupture process. So here I'm just showing some examples about how the fault zone waves change. And this is the famous example of the fault zone guided waves that are recorded by the boho instruments near the Alpen fault. So from all these boho uh, like stations, you can see these large amplitude and very dispersive wave trends following the PNS waves. So these are the fault zone guided waves. And you can see that they can definitely change how the you know, the fault response to the rupture if they are happening at the same time as the cold seismic rupture. And this is a synthetic model that shows, again, the trapped waves or the guided waves and the head waves. I think this is showing that uh, very interesting that not just for the stations close to the fault, which is, uh, you know, uh, demonstrated by this gray box here, but also for the stations not far from the fault, you can observe these trapped waves as well. And this is also showing that uh, if the fault zone is asymmetric, you can observe the head waves, you know, these small wiggles here that propagate along the slower side of the fault and can catch up the direct waves, which again, we will modulate the rupture front if there is an earthquake happening inside. And we have observed like how these fault zone waves can change the earthquake source properties in both the earthquake cycle simulations and rupture simulations. And they can lead to different kinds of uh, source complexity that is not observed in homogeneous simulations. So for example, this uh, is one large earthquake simulated within the earthquake cycle models. And uh, this just shows the spatial and temporal variation of the sleep rate. So you can see that this is the nucleation phase of the earthquake. And then this is the up deprobation of the rupture and down deprobation of the rupture. 
And if you look at the sleep rate function, just uh, you know, after the sleep, uh, like the rupture front, you can see a lot of oscillations here. And this can be uh, even more easy to say, is to see if you just do a cross section and draw the sleep rate function in the blue line as shown by the bottom figure here. So all these oscillations of the sleep rate are actually associated with the reflections inside the phosons. So when the reflections with positive stress perturbations come in, they're trying to accelerate the fault a little bit more, but then the reflections with the negative stress uh, concentration or perturbation come in and they can actually heal uh, the sleep rate function. Another effect of the uh, fault zone waves are from the head waves. So these are from the rupture simulations uh, and I'm plotting the rupture speed normalized by the shear wave speed of the host rock as a function of time here. And for narrower fault zone, you can see that we actually seen an oscillation of the rupture speed and it's oscillating between the shear wave speed of the host rock, which is the red dash line here and the radio wave speed of the fault zone. And these oscillation of the rupture speeds is actually correlated with the arrivals of the fault zone head waves. And then if the fault damage zones get wider, at some point, we are also seeing super shear rupture speed transition. So this is a four minute super shear rupture speed transition. And the super shear rupture speed here is just slightly above the shear wave speed of the host rock. So this will be considered to be an unstable super shear rupture speed uh, if you're assuming like a, you know, like a vertical fold and horizontal rupture propagation. So now I'm going to show that what would happen in earthquake cycle simulations uh, in our fault zone cases. So here I'm showing that when we have this 2D flower structure in our earthquake cycle simulations, even without the co-seismic damage and inter-seismic scaling, we already start seeing a lot of uh, you know, different behaviors of earthquakes. And in particular, these fold damage zones tend to generate a lot of small scale stress heterogeneities on the fold. So for the same uh, frictional and stress conditions, we are observing periodic occurrence of magnitude seven earthquakes in homogeneous simulations. But for these 2D flower simulations, we're seeing earthquakes with different magnitudes and hypocenter locations. So in this particular figure, uh, this is like the spatial, uh, like distribution of the cold seismic steep plotted for every 0.1 second in orange. And the blue lines here show the inter seismic steep for uh, like every two years. So you can see that this is one small earthquake and this is like one large earthquake right here. And also they have like hypocenter locations alternating between shallower and deeper depths. The right figure here shows the peak sleep rate variation on the fold. And uh, whenever you know, this sleep rate gets higher than one millimeter per second, that's considered to be an earthquake. So all these are like the earthquakes, but you can see that between the earthquakes, there are also like a bunch of slow events that don't really reach the seismic threshold, but they still really stresses on the fault that tend to like delay the occurrence of the subsequent earthquakes. Another interesting effect of the fault damage zone in earthquake cycle simulations is that they can affect where earthquakes happen. And the four histograms I'm showing here are the depth variation of the hypocenters uh, for fault zones that terminate at different depths. So the lead blue box here shows the depth extent of the fault damage zone. You can see that for very shallow damage zones then we start seeing earthquakes mostly concentrating near the frictional boundary in our simulations in which we have the transition from the weakening friction to the strengthening friction. But if the fault damage zones gets a little bit deeper, then we start seeing that most earthquakes in occur inside the damage zone structure or along this material interface. And in some cases, we even observe this bimodal distribution of the seismicity which means that we have strong clustering of earthquakes both at shallower depth and at deeper depth. And this kind of bimodal distribution of seismicity is kind of similar to what has been observed in some regions in California. 
So now I'm going to allow the co-seismic damage and inter-seismic healing in our simulations. And we actually start by doing this using a very simple damage evolution model. And this particular model have three parameters. So the first parameter is the co-seismic damage accumulation, which means that we allow these shear models to drop by a few percent after the earthquake. And then uh, we are allowing this shear models to increase during a certain uh, time, which is the interseismic heating time here. And this is more like a logarithmic you know, healing. And for some of the simulations, we also allow this fault damage zone to permanent, like to have a permanent damage, which means that there could be like a 1% or 0.5% rigidity reduction, which is permanent after each earthquake. So if we have this permanent damage, this would actually allow the fault zone to, uh, you know, change from the immature state or evolve from the immature state, which has a lower velocity contrast to like the more mature state in which we have a higher velocity contrast. And here we are using like a threshold of 30% velocity reduction to discriminate the immature and the mature state in our earthquake cycle simulations. Well, if we just look at two reference simulations that you know, represent the immature fault zone and the mature fault zone, we can already see very distinct behaviors of earthquakes. So the left figure here is from the immature fault zone, and you can see that the shear models here has a 5% velocity reduction after that earthquake, and then it heals back to the pre-earthquake level. So the shear modelers changes between 80% and 85% of the host rock. And for the mature fault zone case, the shear models of the fault zone changes between 40% and 45% of the host rock. And the blue lines here show the maximum steep rate on the fault. So the dash line here gives like the seismic threshold we're assuming in these simulations. And assuming this one millimeter per second seismic threshold, you can see that the recurrence intervals between earthquakes in the immature fault zone case are much more irregular compared to the mature fault zone case. And also between these earthquakes, we are seeing a lot of these slow events again. And these slow events can actually uh, release stresses, as I mentioned, and change the recurrence intervals here. But these slow events don't happen that often in the mature fault zone scenario. You can also look more closely into like how the sleep is distributed along depth. And you're also seeing very different behaviors. So for the immature fault zone case, we're seeing a lot of subsurface events that don't really rupture to the free surface. And then between these small subsurface events, we're also seeing a bunch of slow events. And it's very interesting to see the slow events can actually propagate into the velocity weakening region and release the stresses there. But then for the mature fall zone case, we're seeing something that are similar to our rupture simulations. So we are seeing these pulse-like ruptures that can rupture to the free surface. And uh, these pulses are demonstrated by this almost flat distribution of the final sleep here. We also investigate further, like why we could have these slow sleep events in the immature fall zone case. And we find that this co-seismic damage and inter-seismic healing is very important to promote these slow sleep events. So for example, the lap simulation is just the one simulation that has a constant shear models of 65%. And for this, particular scenario, we are only seeing periodic occurrence of large earthquakes that can propagate to the surface. But then if we allow these shear models to change between 60% and 65%, we start seeing that this inter healing, during the inter healing time, there could be a bunch of slow sleep events that occur near the previously ruptured region and then slowly propagate to the velocity weakening region here. You can also see there is penetration of crip into the locked region as well. And as a result, the earthquakes tend to occur you know, in another place where the stress hasn't been released yet. So there is an alternating rupture extent you know, of the subsequent earthquakes. And for the bottom mm -hmm. figure, 
Yes. Hi, it's Chris. Um, <clears throat> super interesting. And you've told us a fair bit about the depth. Maybe I, I missed it, but when you when you talk about the flower structures or just in general, is the width of the zone of the fault zone damage zone come into play too or not yet? So for uh, for the like the previous simulations I'm showing, you know, without like the interseismic healing and co-seismic damage. So we have tested different like full zone geometry, like the, you know, different width, you know, different depth, you know, all these factors. Although like the seismicity distribution can be different, but, you know, we're still seeing that when you have the structure, you tend to see a lot smaller earthquakes and, you know, more complex behaviors. And for the interseismic, uh, like for these particular simulations I'm showing here, yeah, we are just showing like one constant fault zone damage and I like width, and I believe it's like several hundred meter as well. Um, but yeah, I think if you are changing the damage zone width to like wider or narrower, it may change this behavior, but still the, like the lower velocity contrast for the immature fault zone is controlling, you know, when we are seeing these slow steep behaviors. Gotcha. So I think the velocity contrast is still the a, a more important parameter. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Right. So I think for then for these particular simulation, um, you know, we also like highlight those slow sleep events timing here, just to show that again we are seeing a longer recurrence interval when we have these slow sleep events happening between the earthquakes in these more immature fault zone simulations. And as I mentioned before, we also allow a permanent damage for some simulations. And this is just a one of the permanent damage simulations. And for this one, we are having like a 1% rigidity reduction after each earthquake. So the top figure here just shows how the shear models changes over time. And I also want to say here that you know, the parameters we are choosing here allow us to accelerate this transition from the immature to the mature full zone scenarios as well. So here you can see that there is a 5% rigidity uh, reduction after each earthquake. And then this is the inter healing time, but then this damage never goes back to the pre-earthquake level. So, which means that at some point, this full zone damage would evolve to a more mature case in which we may have more than 30% velocity reduction. So then the bottom figure here just shows like how the seismic steep varies between the immature and mature stage. But again, I think what we are seeing here is similar to the previous two reference simulations. For the immature fault zone case, we're seeing like more subsurface events and occurrence of slow steep events in between. But for the mature fault zones, we're seeing more uh, surface rupturing events and also like more regular earthquake cycle behaviors. Well, another note I want to make here is that I think this uh, difference between the mature and immature fall zones may also have implications for the paleoseismic studies. It means that how well the surface deep can represent the earthquake behaviors actually depends on the fault zone maturity. So if we uh, plot the cumulative sleep, you know, using the surface measurements and also using sleep at 10 kilometer depth, um, you can see that this is like how the earthquake sleep evolved and also how the interseismic uh, sleep change, change over time. And even like the surface co-seismic sleep here is smaller than the co-seismic sleep mirrored at 10 kilometer depth, but you know the variation of the cold seismic steep and also the recurrence intervals are already represented very well by the surface steep measurements. However, if we go to the immature stage, then for the surface steep uh, measurements, they are dominated by the inter seismic steep. So we'll have to go to like a deeper part of the fault to see how the steep varies and also how the recurrence intervals change over time. And besides this co-seismic damage and inter-seismic healing, there are also other kinds of temporal variations of the seismic wave velocities. And in particular, these kind of precursory velocity change can happen before earthquakes. And this has been like a really interesting topic 
you know, starting from like 1970s, like when people were trying to see whether this could be used as an indicator, like for the, uh, like the timing or the magnitude of the earthquake. So for example, in this Wacom paper in 1973, um, they have observed this temporal variations of P waves, speeds, and also S wave speeds, like about three and a half years before the occurrence of the 1971 Mantu 6.4 San Fernando earthquake. So like there was like seems to be a huge reduction of the P wave velocity first, and then there was a gradual increase of the P wave velocity before that earthquake happened. Uh, similar kind of behavior has been observed in the S waves as well. But again, the P waves here are more sensitive uh, you know, to the processes before the earthquake. And recently there have been like several field observations and also lab experiments that have documented this kind of precursory velocity changes before the earthquake. So the top figure uh, shows that during the fast stick sleep experiment, uh, before that stick sleep uh, happens, which is demonstrated by this huge reduction of the shear models, there could be like about 1% reduction of the P wave velocity happening before. So this is like the gray box here shows the precursory velocity change period. And this kind of precursory velocity change has also been observed uh, before the 2005 magnitude 3 earthquake in Parkfield uh, using the Seifold data. Although like the precursory velocity change here has a smaller amplitude compared to like what has been observed in the laboratory experiment. And also if you observe like the San Fernando earthquake like observation and the Seifold observation, you can also see that the precursory duration seems to be different and they may depend on the magnitude as well. So this has been proposed already, but the precursors are not just the precursory velocity uh, reduction. You know, people have used different kind of precursors like the p-value change, the VPVS anomaly, write-on, resistivity, and they have shown that there could be a relation between like the magnitude and the precursor duration for like the laboratory earthquakes and also cluster earthquakes. And for the cluster earthquakes, it also seems that the precursor duration could be like in the scale of days. So I think these are all really interesting observations that we can uh, test to see their effects in our simulations as well. So how does this precursor velocity change can affect our earthquake cycle behaviors? And I think the precursors can change the earthquake nucleation process a lot. And even we don't consider the precursors when we have the fault damage zones, we can already see a very different nucleation because the critical nucleation size of the earthquakes will be greatly reduced as we have a lower shear models inside uh, the fault zone structure. And this figure tries to show that usually before the uh, spontaneous rupture propagation of the earthquake, there is a region that features the unstable and accelerating deformation of the fault. And then this accelerating or this unstable region has to reach a critical size, which is 12 LC here in order for the spontaneous rupture to propagate. And you can estimate this critical nucleon size, you know, based on like a radiant state friction law for the mole three crack as shown by Rubin and Puro in 2005. So this H star, which is the critical nucleon size is scaled with the shear models mu and also the frictional parameters like L, B, and A here, as well as the effective normal stress, which is sigma. We can also estimate you know, how this critical Newton size changes if we have a fault zone uh, by assuming like a layered medium. So this is like the Newton size estimated for fault zones with different shear wave uh, velocity reductions and also like width. You can see that as the shear wave velocities decrease inside the fault zone. And also as the fault damage zones get wider, we are seeing a huge reduction of the nucleon size as well. So this means that it is easier for earthquakes to nucleate inside the fault damage zones because they have a smaller nucleon size. Okay, so then going back to the precursory velocity change, 
when we have this precursor valve change, they're going to introduce an extra shear stress, well, sorry, shear modulus reduction that may further reduce the nutrient size. But because the precursors here are you know, happening at different durations, so the effects will be nonlinear. And here we are just using an earthquake cycle simulation with a one kilometer wide fold zone with 30% of loss reduction inside. And uh, the right figure here shows how the shear wave velocity changes in our simulations. So here, as the fold starts accelerating, we are going to give this precursory velocity change for a certain sleep rate threshold. And yearly, like days after this precursory velocity change, earthquakes would occur like right here. And then after the earthquake during the post seismic period, once the unfold acceleration gets back to zero, and once the sleep rate gets back to like somewhere below the one millimeter per second threshold, we also allow the healing of the fold zone materials. And here, the timing of the precursor velocity change is determined by the sleep rate threshold when fold starts accelerating. And we also determine a precursor onsite time or precursor duration by using like the difference between the uh, timing of the precursor and the timing of the earthquake. So for this particular simulation, the precursor onsite time is 20 days. And the right table here shows this correspondence between the sleep rate threshold and precursor onsite time that we have in our simulations for a characteristic sleep distance of two millimeter. So you can see that as the sleep rate threshold decreases, we're going to have longer precursor onset time, but all the sleep rate threshold here is higher or faster than the background creep rate, which is 10 to minus nine, nine meter per second. And also this relationship will be different, you know, as we're going to have another characteristic sleep distance of eight millimeter, per se, uh, eight millimeter as well. Okay, so for these relatively large characteristic sleep distance of eight millimeter, we see that the precursor velocity reduction of just 0.5% can already facilitate the slow sleep events during the earthquake cycles to grow into earthquakes. The top figure here compares the maximum sleep rate on the fault for the no precursor case, which is red, and the precursor case, which is the blue dashed line here. So when there are no precursors, you're seeing some slow sleep events here. But then after we have the precursors, these slow sleep events actually grow into earthquakes. And we can actually zoom into this time to see how the uh, slow sleep events grow into earthquakes. So here we are adding that 0.5% uh, velocity reduction. And after that, there is a linear and also very fast increase of the sleep rate and uh, grows into the seismic you know, sleep rate threshold range. But then if we don't have this precursor velocity change, the sleep rate actually grows uh, slowly and also never reaches the seismic sleep rate threshold. We also see that once we have this precursory velocity change, there is a huge difference in the nutrient size of the earthquake as well. So here we're just zooming into the nucleation stage for the no precursor and one day precursor case. And you can see that the nucleation size when we have a one day precursor is actually like less than one half of the nucleation size of the case when we don't have any precursor. So this is a very large contrast considering that the precursor bus change is only 0.5% here. So if we're using that equation that I just showed earlier, we're not going to be able to estimate such a large difference in the nutrient size of the earthquakes. We also find that the, when we have longer precursor duration, we're going to have smaller nuclear size as well. But again, this relationship is not linear. So for example, if you compare the nuclear size for the earthquake when we have a five hour precursor to the nuclear size when we have one day and 20 days precursors, um, this you know, longer precursor time definitely reduces the nuclear size a lot but there's not much difference if you compare like one day and 20 day precursor scenarios. And we find that when we have these relatively large characteristic sleep distance, 
uh, although the precursors tend to accelerate the occurrence of the earthquakes, but the final earthquake magnitudes tend to uh, turn out to be similar between all these different uh, you know, precursor durations. However, things are a little bit different. You know, if you're going to use a smaller characteristic sleep distance, and we all know that when we are using a smaller characteristic sleep distance, the nutrient size will be further reduced and the seismicity will become uh, more complex. But we also see that the longer precursor duration still facilitates the earthquake to occur earlier, although the earthquake size and recurrence intervals become more variable. So on the top here, it shows that comparison between no precursor in gray and one hour precursor in blue. So you can see that there are some small earthquake, like some slow sleep events before the earthquakes happen here. And the earthquake time is definitely uh, earlier compared to the no precursor scenario. And if you compare the one hour and 30 day precursor case, you can see that the, um, you know, the earthquakes are happening even earlier and also the recurrence intervals become shorter and shorter as we go to like the later part of the earthquake cycles as well. And in these kind of simulations, we are also observing more earthquakes with less average cold seismic sleep. So here on the top, it shows the no precursor case in which we only have three large earthquakes. And also we have some small earthquakes here as well. But then for the 20 day precursor case, you can see that we have five large earthquakes in this particular time window um, and also small earthquakes. So if you look more closely, you can see that there is transition from the slow sleep events, oops, from the slow sleep events in the no precursor case to like the small earthquakes in the 20 day precursor case. And then when we have the small earthquakes here in the no precursor case, we actually observe like a large earthquake in the 20 day precursor case. So which means that when there is a small characteristic sleep distance, there is a tendency for these simulations to have larger events, like the, they tend to make these small earthquakes to grow into the larger ones as well. And this means that the magnitude frequency distribution of the earthquakes will be uh, different. So here we are plotting the magnitude frequency distribution of the earthquakes for the no precursor case compared to like one hour, two day, 20 day and 30 day precursors uh, for the smaller characteristic steep distance simulations. So you can see that when we have these precursors, we tend to see a larger number of large earthquakes like larger than the magnitude six over here. But then we're also seeing that there is a gap of the intermediate magnitude earthquakes like between magnitude four and magnitude five after we have the precursors. And if we go to the smaller magnitude range, we're seeing more earthquakes again. So which means that the precursors also let the slow events to grow into the small earthquakes as I showed earlier. So what's next? Here I'm showing that you know, these temporal evolution of the full zone structure can actually modulate the earthquake cycle behaviors a lot. And this is definitely something that we can consider in our earthquake cycle simulations. But we also want to consider something more realistic to allow these full zone material properties to change over time. And we know that the all fault plastic deformation will be something important to consider as the cold seismic rupture can produce these all fault factors that contribute to the evolution of the fault zone damage. And the left figures here show like the generation of the all fault factors in uh, earthquake rupture simulations. So you can see that they may be uh, uh, symmetrically distributed along one side of the fault and usually they originate from the rupture front where we have the high sleep rate but then these outfold fractures can also coalesce and form these network that contribute to the damage generation. On the right, I'm also showing that if we allow the outfold plastic deformation in the fold damage zones, we are going to see like very interesting damage patterns that are correlated with the rupture dynamics as well. So as I discussed previously, 
the foson head waves can accelerate and decelerate the rupture. So here you can see that you can actually have an oscillating or periodic pattern of the alpha damage just because of the accelerating and decelerating rupture front after that particular earthquake. And in a very recent paper by Mia et al. in GRL, they have incorporated the viscoplastic deformation in their fully dynamic earthquake cycle simulations. And they show that these viscoplastic deformation can promote this spatial and temporal clustering of the seismicity. And this is because the generation of the plastic strand may act as barrier for the rupture propagation. So then afterwards, you know, the partial rupture would leave like stress concentration in other part of the fold that then promote the earthquake rupture again. And I think it's actually interesting and important to consider how we can convert all these plastic strands to the variation of the material properties in the fold zones. So then we can allow this feedback between the plastic deformation and the material properties. And in another direction that we are going is the observations. Like I mentioned, there are a lot of observations based on the foson guided waves and the reflections or the active surveys, but still we need more high resolution observations about like the alone strike variation or like the depth of the fault zone, which is still debatable at this point. So here I'm just showing that uh, through a synthetic test that we may be able to use the broadband stations to understand the fault diamond zone better. So in this synthetic test, we are having a 400 meter wide fault zone and four kilometer long fault zone. And the orange star here shows the hypocenter location of a point source, which is like a small earthquake inside the fault zone. And then we have a bunch of seismic stations around the fault. And here in the middle, we are simulating the seismograms recorded by these broadband stations. Uh, a little bit further away from the fold. And you can see that in the direction close to fold strike, which is zone one here, we are seeing that this one second P wave window actually contains a lot of reverberations, which are the reflections inside the fold zones that can propagate into stations further away. But then if you go to the directions perpendicular to the fold, you are not seeing those reverberations that much. So you are seeing much cleaner P waves arrivals. And then if we do velocity spectra of this one second P wave window, you can see that there is a huge contrast between their spectral content for the zone one stations besides this corner frequency of the earthquake, which is the first peak here. We're also seeing a second peak and this second peak is corresponding to the fault zone waves that I just discussed, but we don't see these fault zone wave uh, signatures in the zone two stations. And we have also put this into observations and see that from the 2003 Big Bear sequence, we can actually observe these kind of azimuthal variation of the velocity spectra. So here we are uh, you know, investigating this cluster A, which is very close to the Big Bear hypocenter. And we use a cluster of events with highly similar waveforms. So then when we are stacking their velocity spectra together, we can cancel part of their source effects. And here you can see that again in the zone two, we're just seeing one corner here, which corresponds to like the collective, you know, corner frequency of that cluster of events. But then if we're going to zone one, we are seeing that there is another high frequency peak that may correspond to the full zone structure here. And right now we are applying this method to the Ridgecrest sequence. So here, all these clusters are like clusters with similar waveforms that we're going to use in our analysis. And on the right, I'm showing like the three clusters, A, B, C here. And you can see that although their uh, you know, stations are not ideal because the azimuthal coverage is not like so uh, good in the west side of the cluster, but still we have stations in both zone one and zone two. And then if we plot their stack velocity spectra on the right, we are seeing more high frequency energy in zone one than zone two for these three clusters. And it's also worthwhile mentioning that these clusters are happening at somewhere five to seven kilometer for some of the clusters. 
which means that the fold damage zones may actually extend to the deeper part of the fold. So just to conclude my talk here, I'm showing that this property of the near fold materials can actually change over time because different processes like the accelerating fold deformation before the earthquakes, the co seismic damage, and also the inter seismic healing. We also find that if we allow this co seismic damage and inter seismic healing, the immature fold zones can promote the occurrence of the slow steep events in the velocity awakening region that limit earthquake sizes. And but for like when the material, uh, like earthquakes occur in the mature fold zones, they can actually rupture to the surface and occur more regularly. We also find that when we have these precursory velocity changes, they yearly accelerate the nucleation of the earthquakes and shorten uh, the earthquake reference intervals. And sometimes if the characteristic steep distance is small, then these precursory velocity change can also promote the occurrence of large earthquakes. And I think that's all I have today. Thank you. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. I'll ask everyone to unmute themselves and join me in thanking you all for a fabulous talk. Yeah.